Hi, my name is Banaz Arzani and I'm a six-year PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. Today I'll be presenting our tool Net Pro, which allows us to identify the entity responsible for failures in data center networks. This is joint work with Microsoft while I was an intern there, and uh, it's in collaboration with Salim Siraki, my advisor Boon Taolu, Asaf Schuster, and Jeff Altred. Data centers can fail, and we've seen it happen in big ways when Amazon Web Services failed, or when Azure failed, or even when Google data centers experienced an outage uh, because of lightning strikes. But these are big failures. Failures happen on a smaller scale on a day-to-day -day basis. For, and the problem with failures is that they're disruptive. So they result in a significant user downtime, which results in loss of revenue for network providers and lower quality of service for the users. So we need good debugging tools in order to identify why they happen and to resolve them. But debugging is hard. And to understand why debugging is hard, let's look at an example. Let's assume I'm a researcher at Penn and I want to use a service in the cloud. To do that, I might even decide to use a VM that's deployed in the cloud, go over the cloud network, and then finally connect to the service. The problem is, though, that I'm a researcher at Penn. I'm using a service that belongs to the cloud. Let's say it's in Azure. And I'm going over the cloud network, again in Azure. And then I'm using a service that doesn't belong to Azure or to Penn. So in the case of failure, one of two things can happen. So either we have the network come out and say, I know why the problem happened and I can fix it. Or the service comes out and says, I know why the problem happened and I can fix it. Or it could even be the case that I wrote a bad application and I'm the one who has to fix it. But if I know about it, I can accept responsibility and do that. And this is a good scenario because someone is ex accepting responsibility for the problem and therefore they can fix the problem. The bad thing happens when we have the network blame the service, the service blame the network, and no one really accepts responsibility for the failure. So there's a back and forth that goes on, and the failure never gets resolved. So a real example of this happening is what we call Event X in Azure. And Event X is um, we have hypervisors in Azure connect to a remote service. And whenever that connection to that service fails, the VM has uncertain state, and therefore it panics and reboots. So when this happens, we always have the question of whose fault was it? Was it the network or was it the service that failed? Current debugging tools aren't really enough to solve this problem. So we have Sherlock and NetMedic, which were also developed by Microsoft. And they give us a probabilistic distribution of what is the most likely cause of failure. We also have TRAT, which sniffs TCP packets and later reasons about what are the bottlenecks in TCP communications. We also have NetProfiler that correlates across connections and then identifies what these connections have in common and therefore what is their most likely source of failure. And finally, there's SNAPS that uses socket options to get TCP information and then combines that with topological information and correlations across connections in order to identify the source of the problem. But all of these tools have one thing in common, and that is that they either can't be used in an always-on manner, so they're too heavyweight, or that they require some form of information sharing between the various entities that are involved in the communication process. So we asked ourselves, can we do better than that? And we developed a tool we call NetPoreau, which we deploy on all of our VMs. And it captures a certain set of information from that, those VMs. We also have a fault injector that randomly injects failures into the communication path of a subset of these VMs. And then we collect that information and then send it to a learning agent. That learning agent then distributes a diagnostic functions to all of the instantiations of NetPoreau, which can then utilize that in order to identify what was the cause of failure when a failure happens. But what does the monitoring agent capture? So the monitoring agent captures TCP ETW events, and it forms a digest of these events and sends it back to the learning agent. And ex some examples of what metrics we capture include the number of duplicate acts, number of triple duplicate acts, times we spent in zero window probing, and so on. But how do we digest these TCP ETW events? For, so for each TCP metric that we capture, we can compute the min, max, fifth, uh, 10th, 50th, and 95th percentile, as well as the mean and standard deviation across all metrics uh, in an epoch, which for us is a 30 second period, across all connections that are active within that epoch. And what that allows us to do is that it allows us to reason about how these connections compare in terms of performance for each metric. But why do we think this can work? Well, TCP sees the entire communication path. It goes through the network, it goes through the client, and it also goes through the service. So if any one of these fails, TCP theoretically should see it. And we already know how TCP reacts to network failures. For example, we know that if we have packet drops, we should see an increase in the number of duplicate acts. We also know that if we have large queues, we should see an increase in the smooth RTT estimates. 
But what do we expect when we have failures at the two endpoints? We can't really reason about how TCP would react to those based on basic principles of protocol design. But can we learn that? And that's why we decided to use decision trees in order to do so. And the reason we picked decision trees in particular as opposed to other machine learning algorithms was because other machine learning algorithms combine and manipulate features, which makes it hard to reason about why failures happened. But let's quickly go over what decision trees are. Well, decision trees in each step pick the feature with the most information gained. And to go over what information gain is, let's look at an example. Let's say we have a question, and that question is, will it rain today? We have a certain amount of uncertainty about that question. Let's say that is some value x. Now someone comes along and tells us, hey, it's cloudy outside. So our uncertainty about this problem is no longer x, but it's some other value. So our question now has become, will it rain today, given that I now know that it's cloudy outside? And our uncertainty is now some value x minus y. And that y, that reduction in amount of uncertainty that I have, that's the information gain. So decision trees try to pick the most informative feature in each step and therefore reduce the uncertainty of the final result that they output. So decision trees on their own are not enough to do this, though. So let's assume that our data looks like this. Well, it doesn't really look like this. It's like something like this. So we have different colors for different types of failures. And so we have different classes. But let's assume our data is two-dimensional for a second, and we can plot this on two, two axes. Well, as you can see, the data on the left is easiest to classify because it doesn't have anything in common with the other failure types that we have. The data on the right, though, is harder to classify because it shares some features with the other failures that are in the data. So how do we handle this? What, what we did was we, we thought we would do the following. We would first label everything except for the easiest failures to classify. And for TCP data, it's probably going to be the network failures as a unified label. So we label everything except for network failures with a unified label, let's say normal. And then what we do is that we try to train a tree based on that. So here's an example tree that we have from doing this. And it's distinguishing between no network failures and everything else. And as you can see, the topmost feature of this tree is the, max, uh, the mean of the maximum congestion window across all connections that are present in a 30-second epoch. And we also have the number of duplicate acts as prominent features. And we expect this for network, uh, for network failures, because we expect that if we have, for example, throttling in the network, we should see a decrease in the bandwidth delay product. And therefore, we should see a decrease and change in the congestion window of the connections that we have. We also expect, for example, if we have packet drops, to see an increase in the duplicate acts. And therefore, it makes sense that that also is prominent in uh, the features that are picked by the decision tree. In the next step, we get rid of all the network failures that we have, and we keep server-side failures as the next feature of failure that we want to identify. And we label everything else, all the other failure types that we have, as a unified label. Let's say we label them as normal. So here's an example tree of what we might see for this particular type of classification, where we try to distinguish between server-side failures and everything else. And we see that the metric related to the RTT estimates is the topmost in the tree. So what it shows, for example, is that if the server is busy and it can't respond, we see a delayed acknowledgement coming back, which results in an increase in our smooth RTT estimates. Now, finally, we also get rid of our server-side failures. And now what we have left is client-side failures and, and everything else, which is now just normal data, where our definition of normal is now that fail data that doesn't have any failures in it. So again, here's an example tree for an example application. And what we see here is that the topmost feature is metrics that are related to the amount of time we spend in zero window probing. But let's think about it. When does zero, zero window probing happen? So if the server side is busy and it can't keep up and it can't read from the receive socket fast enough, the receiver runs out of buffer. And therefore, it lets the client know that it sh shouldn't send any more information. And the client goes into what we call zero window probing mode, where it, where it keeps asking whether I can now send data. But when the client is busy, so let's say we have a client fa failure, and client failure might be that the client is under high CPU load. What would happen is that the client is now posting less data onto the socket, and therefore the server can keep up, and so we spend less time doing zero window probing. And that's why it's a prominent feature in this tree. So here's what our, what our algorithm ends up looking like. We first identify whether we have a network failure or not. If the answer to that is yes, we go to the network operative. If not, we then ask whether it's a server-side failure or not. If the answer to that question is yes, we go to the server-side uh, people. And then finally, if it's not a server-side problem, we ask whether it's a client-side failure. So it, was it my application that caused the failure? And if the answer to that question is 
But yes, then we resolve that problem that way. So doing that by itself is not enough to solve the problem, though. We also had to use um, random force in order to have more stable accuracies. But more importantly, we also had to do per application training. And to see why that's important, let's look at an example here. Let's say I have an application developer, and he decides that whenever I see throughput that drops below, below some value x, I'm going to open more connections in order to compensate. A different developer, or even the same developer with a different thought process might decide that if the throughput goes below x, I'm just going to send more data on my connection. So these two are observed by NetPuro with two very different characteristics. In one, when I have a failure, I see an increased number of connections. In the other, when I have a failure, I see an increased number of bytes posted to the socket. And while if I lump all of this data together, they act as noise, so it's hard for me to distinguish what happened, if I do per application training, this data is actually useful. I can utilize that data in order to identify why a failure happened. And that is why we do per application training. So finally, we also had to normalize our, our data in order to ensure that we don't have any dependency on the amount of data that the, that the application is posting to the socket for the metrics that also actually depend on that. So before I show you how well all of this works in practice, let me talk a little bit about what we learned from doing all this. Well, first, we learned that TCP actually sees everything, even just if we just look at TCP data from the client side. So it goes through the client, the service, and the network, and it sees a failure no matter where it happened. And we can actually utilize this in order to identify what, where the failure occurred. But we also saw that failures within a class, for example, high CPU load on the client side, or high memory load on the client side, or high I.O. load on the client side, have very similar characteristics. And this has two very important consequences. The first consequence is that we can't really distinguish the actual failure type within a class that easily, as easily as we would be able to say whether it's a client-side failure or a server-side failure. But more importantly, it also makes NetPuro resilient to failures that we haven't seen in the past. So for example, if even if I don't have any examples of high CP load on the client in my training set, I can still identify it correctly in my test when I'm doing testing as a client-side problem. And that is because these different failure types are very similar uh, in terms of how they re TCP reacts to them. We also saw that the, the relationship between failures and the TCP metrics is nonlinear. And we found that out by looking at the Pearson correlation between the data we have from TCP and the label that is assigned to it. And what this means actually for us is that an operator can't really eyeball the data and identify where the problem is coming from. Finally, for those of you who are interested in machine learning, we found that the feature space for failures in terms of TCP data is actually very compact. So what that means is if you compute the two highest eigenvalues of the feature space, you find that those two are by themselves are sufficient to, uh, to capture 95% of the variance within that data. So now how do we evaluate this? So what we first ask ourselves in terms of evaluation is what is the worst case performance we expect from NetPuro? And the worst case performance happens when we have applications that don't really react to failures. So if an application reacts to failures, we can actually use that information to make more informed decisions about why the failure occurred. So what we did in order to identify the worst case performance is that we created our own application that doesn't react to failures, but replaced traffic that we captured from actual production devices. The next thing we wanted to identify is, given that we are using supervised learning, it's very important to know what happens if we don't have examples for a particular type of failure in our data set. And this can happen in one of two ways, actually. So one thing that can happen is what we call dormant failures, which are failures that are there while we're training, but we don't know they're there. So we mislabel our data as normal data by accident. The other type of failure that we could have is what we call unknown failures. And those are failures that happen for the first time in testing. So how do we get training data to do this? Well, we injected failures into the communication path of applications in the Azure Data Center for a period of six months. And some examples of failures we induce is high CPU load on the client, high I.O. load on the server, throttling in the network, packet drops in the network, and so on. So here's how we, how we do for the worst case application. And this is the application that doesn't react to failures, but replace traffic that we capture from production data centers. So let me first explain what the axes are. So on the x-axis, we have normal data, client-side failures, server-side failures, and network failures. And basically what they're showing is what's the correct class of the, the actual data that I had. 
So for, on the y-axis, I, I see the percentage of, of each class that is classified to each class. So for example, let's look at the green bars. The green bar that is labeled on the x-axis as normal data is what percentage of normal data is correctly classified as normal. However, the green bar on the other classes, for example, the green bar in the server-side data type is showing what percentage of server-side failures are incorrectly classified as normal data. On the x-axis, we also have precision values. And what precision tells us it is how much can I trust a particular label that is coming out of Nemporo. So for example, if I say that normal failures have a precision of 89%, that means that you can trust that this failure type is, of, is normal with 0.89 probability. So as you can see here, we can actually classify even server-side problems without having any server-side data with 89% um, accuracy. But what if I haven't seen that failure before? Well, if I haven't seen that failure before, I can't really know what's going to happen in practice, but I can emulate it. And what we did to emulate that behavior is for dormant failures, we picked each class of failure that we had. We purposefully mislabeled it as normal in our training set and then saw what that class is classified as during testing. So for example, we saw that throttling is classified correctly as, as uh, network failures. So for at least for dormant failures, the failures are either correctly classified or they're classified as normal data. So we d we're not incorrectly blaming anyone as being responsible for a failure when they're not the one to blame. But what's even more interesting is what we see for unknown failures. So as you can see for unknown failures, even though we don't have examples for that particular failure in the training set, we're still able to correctly classify it. But what does that tell us? That tells us that there's significant similarity between the different failures within a class so that even though you haven't seen examples of it in the past, you're still able to correctly classify it. So all of that was for the worst case application, but how do we do for real applications? And we tried it on two real applications. One of the applications that we tried is for the application that causes event X. And what we did was we used past tickets in order to do that. And as you can see, our accuracies are much higher than what we saw for the worst case application. So we also tried to see how well we do for streaming YouTube videos. And basically what we did to, do, to achieve that is we just streamed YouTube videos from within the VMs that we had in the, deployed in the cloud. And as you can see, again, we have much higher accuracies, even though we couldn't really show you what, how well we did for server-side failures because we didn't have access to the YouTube servers. So there are a number of things that we didn't end up talking about. The first one being identifying the actual type of failure. We also didn't talk about sensitivity to machine location. So can we train in one data center and then use that data to test in a different one? Aggregation versus per connection classification. So we're aggregating our data within each epoch, but can we still do the same type of classification if I just use per connection data? And it turns out the answer to that is no. Our accuracy actually drops way below what we actually need. How sensitive we are to failure duration since we're using fixed size epochs. Can I still identify failures that last for much, much shorter durations than the epoch duration that I'm using? And then finally, we had to do mod modifications to traditional cross validation because otherwise we would have biases that would prevent us to actually make good predictions in terms of what our error is going to be in practice. So what's next? We also need to be able to figure out a way to get rid of this per application training it's very inconvenient to have to train for each individual application separately. And we think we can do this by using methods such as transfer learning. And so that's the next thing on our agenda for this project. The next thing we also need to do is to see if we can utilize this information in order to actually pinpoint the device responsible for the failure. And we can do that by either using methods such as what NetProfiler did, which is correlate across the information that we have from all our different devices, or we can either try to do this by correlating across connections within the same VM. So in conclusion, I showed you that TCP data has significant information in it that allows us to distinguish where the failure happened, whether it was a network or the service or the client itself that was causing problems for us in data center networks. And this is done through a tool we call NetPerl.